The word energy is used in so many different ways, not all of which are consistent with a scientific understanding of the concept. So how can we talk about the concept of energy in a consistent and scientifically accurate way? Well, a simple analogy might be helpful. It turns out that we can use some basic ideas about what money does and how it works in society to help us better understand the concept of energy. So before we build out our analogy for energy, let's get four basic facts about money in society that we could probably all agree on. Number one, money gives you the ability to do things in society, to put gas in your gas tank, food on your table, pay your bills in general. When money is not being used to do things, it's stored in different places like banks, in your pocket, and it doesn't just have to be physical money, it could be digital currency like cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, or this ability to do something, to, to get things done in society, it could be stored and people buy property and that's worth something. In general, money is transferred between people or between entities when it's not being stored. And how do you get money in society? Well, in a free market society, most people get money by doing work. And when working happens, think about this, you get money, but an employer is gonna lose money. So necessarily, when work happens, there's a transfer of money from one person to another. We can all probably agree on these four basic things, and these have parallels with how we can accurately think about energy. So let's make that a simple analogy. Just like money gives you the ability to do things in society, energy gives you the ability to do things or make changes in the universe. In physics, this ability to do something specifically as the ability to apply a force over a distance. So if something or some things can push on an object while it's moving or pull on it, we'd say that thing or those things are storing energy, this ability to apply a force. Just like money can be stored in a bank, it can be deposited, stored, or withdrawn from different accounts within a bank, checkings accounts or savings accounts. Um, energy can be also stored. It can be added to something. It can hang out there and not being used and it can be removed from what we're going to call different energy storage accounts. And in this video, I'm going to walk through four basic energy storage accounts, which we all need to be familiar with in introductory physics. And just like the word work or working means transferring money from one person to another, from employer to employee, Turns out in physics, we also use the word work to mean something similar with energy. Work, when work happens or there's working, that necessarily involves the transfer of energy from one system to another. Now that we have a common way to talk about energy, let's define some energy storage accounts using a demonstration which is going to go through a series of events. And it's going to involve a car, a rubber band, uh, a sled, and just a track that it's on. And all of these things the rubber band, the low friction car, the track, and the sled is going to be our system. When we talk about a system in physics in terms of energy, it's the object or objects that can store energy. And so we're going to go through a series of events and ask a few questions. So let's just watch what's going to happen first, and then we'll talk about the questions. First, I'm going to stretch the rubber band and attach it to the car, and then let go of the rubber band. That thing's just going to oscillate back and forth. And we're going to try to figure out like, at what points or different times does the system have energy stored in it and what's storing that energy, that ability to do something. I'm going to cut that string attaching the rubber band. It's going to go down. The car is going to make contact with the sled and it's all going to slide to rest. So let's look at what happens first. When I stretch the rubber band, is there any energy stored by our system? Well, yeah, there's energy stored in the stretch rubber band. We've already talked about the fact that an elastic material when stretched or compressed stores what we call spring potential energy or in introductory physics we call it elastic energy. And you can't see the energy stored by the spring, but how do you know when a spring or a rubber band has energy stored in the spring potential energy account? Well, by how much it's stretched or compressed. And just a reminder, the variable that we use to represent spring potential energy is a capital U with a subscript S. We've already talked about this in class, but if you want to go back and review how we came up with the idea of the amount of energy stored in a stretch material, there will be a link in the video description below if you want to check that out. So when I stretch the rubber band, there's going to be some energy stored in the spring potential energy account, and the farther it's stretched, the more energy there is. When I let that rubber band go, let's just see what happened. The car is going to move up and kind of move back and forth. Eventually it's going to come to rest, but what I want you to see is that the rubber band is stretched less 
And so there has to be less spring potential energy stored by that spring. So the question is, where did that energy go? Where was it transferred to? When the rubber band was fully stretched, we'll call that time A and the cart was at rest. Let's use a bar graph to represent some quantity of energy that was stored by that stretched rubber band. We've already derived the equation for the amount of spring potential energy is equal to one half times the spring constant of the rubber band times the amount of stretch squared. So this just shows us that as the stretch is increased or decreased, that changes how much spring potential energy is stored. Well, at some later time after the car was done moving back and forth, it was at rest and the spring was stretched less, or in this case, the rubber band was stretched less. And so at this time, there's less spring poten there's less energy stored in the spring potential energy account. So the question is, if we, let's say we had five bars of energy at the beginning and only one bar left in our spring potential energy account, the other four bars had to go somewhere. Either it's not being stored by our system or it's stored by a different part of our system. Well, think about what change happened from the rubber band being fully stretched to less stretched, well, the car was raised up to some height. So the question is, if something's higher than what it was, does it now have an ability to do something that it didn't before? Sure, the fact that the car is now higher than what it was, when it's given an opportunity, when I cut the string, it was actually able to move. So the fact that it's up higher gave it the ability to move. So that must be related to some energy storage account. We call that the gravitational potential energy account. We use a U sub G to represent that. This is a potential energy and what kind is it? It's the gravitational potential energy. And you can store energy with an object and the earth by increasing the distance between the earth and the object with mass. The farther you separate an object from the earth, the higher you raise it, uh, the more ability it has to do something. So we'd say it has more energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account. And so how can we measure or how can we know when something does or doesn't have energy stored in this energy account? Well, if there's an object with mass above some height of zero or some reference point. If we go back to our energy bar graphs, we can see that when the car is above a height of zero, and let's just say that where the car is at time A, that's the height of zero, where track is level. So when it's here at time B, this is further separated from the Earth, so it's got some energy stored in our gravitational potential energy account. But let's go back to time A. We, did, we said there was only energy stored in the spring potential energy account. Is that true? Does the car and the Earth have zero gravitational potential energy? Does this not have the potential to do anything? Well, if I just move this off the track, it would fall down to the table, or if I moved it off the table, it would fall down to the ground. So I guess the question is, where would the car have to be so the car and the Earth have zero gravitational potential energy? Like sitting on the Earth? Certainly then there would be no more gravitational potential energy unless you dug a hole, right? If you dug a hole, this thing would still, the force of gravity on the car would still be able to make it accelerate and fall down. And so if you get down here, I suppose we could define that as a height of zero, but in reality, we could just dig a deeper and deeper and deeper hole. And so when does the car Earth system have no gravitational potential energy at all? Well, that would actually be only if the car was at the center of the Earth. There, you couldn't dig any deeper. I mean, if you did, then the car would actually fall back towards the center because it's attracted to a spot that's about the center of mass of the Earth. It doesn't really make sense to define a height of zero as at the center of the Earth because no object is going to get there. What makes sense is to define zero where it's convenient. And if the car is not going to get any lower than this track right here, uh, we can just call that a height of zero. And if the car is at that height, then we'll say it has no energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account. So in order for something to store gravitational potential energy, it's not just the car. It's got to be the car and the Earth together because the car is not going to do anything up here unless there's an Earth below it or a planet that's attracting it. And so in order for us to say that our system, the things that can store energy, is storing gravitational potential energy, we have to add the Earth to our system. If the Earth is not a part of our system, we can't include energy as gravitational potential energy. So let's see what happens next and ask where's the energy stored at a later pause time. So I'm gonna come in and cut the string and we're gonna pause it when the car gets back down to a height of zero and now it's actually moving. And the question is, where did the energy go? 
So at time B, we said there's some energy stored in the spring potential energy account. Uh, the remainder of what we had initially added is now being stored in the gravitational potential energy account. When the string is cut and the car gets back down to a height of zero, it's moving. And so where's the energy stored by our system? Or did it leave our system? Well, there's no spring potential energy because the rubber band's not stretched anymore, kind of goes back to its relaxed state. The earth and the car have no more energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account because the car's back to a height of zero. We decided to define this is if the car is at back at this height, there's no stored energy in the gravitational potential energy account. And so where did that energy go? Well, again, what change is now, what's different about our system that wasn't before? Well, we have a moving object. And does a moving object have the ability to apply a force over a distance? Yeah, certainly. If you put your hand in front of the car, the car is going to push on your hand as your hand moves back. And eventually, the car is going to push on that plastic sled and move it back. So moving objects have this, the ability to apply a force over a distance to do something. And so we'd say there's energy stored by moving objects. We call that kinetic energy. Or we would say that there's energy stored in the kinetic energy account when there's an object that's moving. And what would we see that would let us know that there is or there is not energy stored in the kinetic energy account? Well, if something's moving, so if it has a speed. If something's not moving, there's no kinetic energy stored. If it is, there's got to be some. And the faster an object is moving, the more ability it has to apply a force over a distance. And so things moving at higher speeds will have more energy stored in the kinetic energy account. So going back to energy bar graphs, we say that up here at time B, when the car was at this height, there was no kinetic energy because it wasn't moving. When it get, got down here, all that energy is now being stored in the kinetic energy account. So let's go to the last event where the car collides with the sled and then they all kind of slow down and eventually they're at rest. So again, what's happening with the energy? Where is it stored? So when the car was moving, we said there's energy stored in the kinetic energy account. And at some later time, the car and the sled together are not moving. And so that means there can't be any stored energy in the kinetic energy account. There's nothing in the unstretched spring. All of these things are at a height of zero. So the earth and these things have zero gravitational potential energy. And so those four bars of energy that was in the kinetic energy account had to go somewhere. Last time I'll ask this question, what changed happened in our system? This one's not quite so obvious. It's not so apparent to us just observing it. I want you to think about what happens when this plastic sled is sliding against the track underneath it. What change happened? And I want you to think at the microscopic level, not the macroscopic level that we can see. The bottom of the sled and the top of the track, like everything that's made out of solid matter is made out of atoms that are bound together. And everything at a temperature higher than absolute zero, which is pretty much everything in the universe, the molecules or atoms are shaking or vibrating back and forth. And when two surfaces are sliding against one another and there's friction involved, those molecules or atoms shake more vigorously the more friction there is. And the temperature of both surfaces are going to increase. So before each object, they were shaking back and forth slow. After the sliding and the presence of friction, they're shaking more vigorously. And if atoms are moving back and forth faster with more energy, kind of say there's more ability to do something stored on a microscopic level based on the random motion of these atoms. And so we would call that energy being stored in the thermal energy account. And the symbol we use for thermal energy is an E sub TH for thermal energy. And we'd call that the energy stored in the random motion of atoms in a system. If the atoms are moving back and forth at higher speeds more vigorously, there's more energy associated there. And there's ways you can actually use that energy to do something useful. If you go on to take AP Physics 2 or learn about thermodynamics and chemistry, you'll learn about how you can do those things. And you can't see thermal energy. You can't see the random shaking motion of atoms in a system. But how do we know whether or not the thermal energy of a system increased or decreased? Well, look at its temperature. The higher the temperature of an object, the more thermal energy is stored by that object. And if the temperature of an object goes down, then thermal energy will be, must be decreasing. When friction is present, the thermal energy will be going up. So let's look back at the whole sequence of events and kind of look at where the energy was stored at different times. So at time A, I came over and I stretched the rubber band. So um, I added the initial energy as spring potential energy. That energy came from me, from my muscles. And so energy was transferred from me 
to our system that we defined it, specifically to the, the rubber band part of the system. After I let the car go and the rubber band pulled the car up, we said the energy was stored not all this in the spring potential energy account. There's a little left over in the spring potential energy account, but then most of it was stored in the gravitational potential energy account because the car was raised higher than the height we defined as zero. When the string was cut and the car made it back down to a height of zero, it was moving. So the energy that was stored in the gravitational potential energy account was transferred to the kinetic energy account. After the car collided with the sled and they all kind of like friction slowed it down and they were at rest, the energy that was stored in the kinetic energy account for some time was finally stored in the thermal energy account. I hope this was a good introduction to the four basic energy storage accounts that we're going to use in physics. The spring potential energy account, the gravitational potential energy account, the kinetic energy account, and the thermal energy account. If you're interested in learning more about energy bar graphs, there's two linked videos in the description below which walk through one scenario and how to make four different types of energy bar graphs. The first video talks about what happens if we don't include friction or we do include friction, how do energy bar graphs look different. And the second video talks about what happens when energy is either transferred into the system or out of the system. Remember, we call that work. Well, how do we represent work being done, energy transferred into or out of the system? Check out the video below.